Irish people. Foreigners think you're weird. <laughs> And here's why. Hi everyone, it's me. For those of you who don't know me, my name is Alana and I'm a Canadian, but I have been living here in the UK for the last seven years. I stumbled upon this Reddit thread, non-Brits who have been to Britain. What is the weirdest thing about Britain that Brits don't realize is weird? And naturally we have to talk about it. So without further ado, Let's go. I have never seen a McDonald's with police officers acting as late night bouncers slash crowd control until I went to London. This is something that was so surprising to me and I actually was gonna make a video on this at some point and it isn't just London. I have seen them in Kent. Maybe they don't exist in your town or village or city, but they do <laughs> exist. Literal police slash security bouncer type people at a McDonald's at night. Absolutely wild. On the orange juice, it said juicy bits instead of pulp. This is a personal favorite. Pulp is such a boring word, but juicy bits? Suddenly, orange juice is just incredibly interesting. <laughs> and like, logically, it makes sense. Do you want orange juice with the juicy bits within the juice? Or would you like it with no juicy bits? It's just deeply fun to say. One thing I love about living in the UK is the variety of accents. It's not really something that I'm familiar with in Canada, US, there are some varying accents, but you have to travel like quite a long distance to hear them. Here, you can jump on the train for a couple of miles and suddenly the accents change I love it. I can't necessarily pinpoint where someone's accent is from. Like I can do the general ones and like the really obvious ones, but British people have a real innate sense, a real ability to be able to pinpoint exactly where someone is from based on their accent. You identify people and judge them based on where they are from within Britain to an incredible accuracy. Welsh versus Scottish versus English, North versus South. England is not a very big place compared to the US. I don't consider myself culturally different from people who live eight to 10 hours away from me. But if watching British panel shows has taught me anything, it's that being raised two hours from one place to another in England makes you viewed quite differently. So there's two points here. One, British people can suss out someone's accent with pretty decent accuracy. And two, there is a level of judgment. I think that's fair to say. You may not judge them verbally, but in your mind, you might think, oh, they're from there. That makes sense. I think with Canadians, where so many Canadians sound very similar, there's no real ability to just be like, oh, they're from Victoria. I could tell. Or, oh, they're from Belleville. Yeah, that sounds about right. <laughs> I found it interesting that all the pint glasses had a little crown seal and certification of the amount in the glass with a fill line and everything. And someone actually responded to this post saying, this is actually part of the Weights and Measures Act in the UK. All alcoholic beverages have a certain milliliter they need to abide by. Any more is illegal, any less, then you are being stingy. And apparently this act, this legislation specifies, like if it is a certain type of drink, how much milliliters should that drink have for it to be sold appropriately. Now this is actually something that I had never really noticed before. Um, I didn't know that there was legislation around this, perhaps British people watching. Let me know in the comments. I'm just happy to have a pint. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> right. Well, it's the need to start sentences with the word right even though it's not necessary. I love saying right. When in doubt, say right. Someone actually responded to this saying, it's actually against the law here to leave a group of people without slapping your leg and saying, right then, I'm off. I love this. I think it is such a funny, unwritten rule when it comes to British culture. Where I've lived here almost eight years, it's gonna be eight years in November, how exciting. There's certain things that you are not ever going to be told about. They are just things that you'll notice and then you will keep noticing them over the years and then you will realize that this is very much an unwritten rule of British culture. And saying right 
And also slapping your knee when you're trying to like leave a conversation or leave a gathering or a party is so intertwined with British life, especially when you don't want to be rude. Like say you're at a party at someone's house and you want to leave. You don't want to be rude. You don't want to just stand up and be like, all right, I'm leaving now. You kind of need like a little, like a little something to say, a little introduction, a little throwaway line. So you slap your knees and you go, right, well, we best be off then. You're not gonna leave immediately because you're still gonna like do this really dragged out goodbye, but at least it signifies that you are going to leave. Soon-ish. Roundabouts are bloody everywhere. The quality of roads and the amount of road work without anyone actually working is pretty bad. Now, I think this is fair to say it's going to be very specific to an area. Um, I think our local roads are pretty decent. Um, there's definitely times when I've driven past roadworks or I've walked past roadworks and they've got all the signs and stuff and nobody's there. That does happen. <laughs> and when it comes to roundabouts, I get it. I have been yelled at online <laughs> over the years that roundabouts are far superior than intersections and I get it. I understand they're safer. They're better for the flow of traffic, all this other stuff. They don't come naturally to me, and um, that's just something that I have to deal with. But there are roundabouts everywhere. Not all roundabouts are created equal. I remember there was one roundabout. I used to live in a subdivision. There's a roundabout like to get out, and it was huge. And the way the subdivision like came into the roundabout, you ended up sitting there forever because there was always traffic going past. And that was one of the roundabouts that I learned how to do roundabouts on. And I just honestly thinking about it now, I have goosebumps. It's stressful. I get that they are superior. You don't have to tell me in the comments. You don't have to email me. I get it. They just don't come naturally to me. And where I sold my car in 2020 and I've been without a car since, I can get around with public transport, I can use the trains when they're not on strike. Um, and I will get a car eventually, just I don't think I need one right now. I'm trying to save money and all that fun stuff. But when I do get a car, it's gonna be many years since I've driven. So. <laughs> Stay tuned for that mess. Next up, we have a little bit of a story about snow. It snowed three inches in London while I was on a semester abroad. Our economics professor told me this really impassioned story at the beginning of class about how he had to carry his son from the car into daycare instead of letting him walk for fear of his shoes. The tenor of his voice carried this feeling of stark indignity at being so inconvenienced. It was as if this cloud had come along and dumped a direct insult instead of a bit of snow. All had been right with the world and now it wasn't. I don't even remember his precise words anymore, but the tone of them has always stuck with me. And a British person responded saying, we're not very good at snow. <laughs> This is something I both love and hate. Um, way back when I was here for the Beast from the East, if you guys remember that, I did a video. It was the most snow I had ever seen in England and have ever seen since. It was that storm. Nothing else compares. But I found it quite funny because I made it into work that day. I took two buses to get into work as normal. I sit down at my desk and my boss is like, why are you here? And I'm like, because it's a Tuesday. And they basically said, you shouldn't have bothered. We're gonna shut down. Public transport actually shut, which I've never seen before. So I couldn't even get home. I had to get a ride with somebody. Normally on the bus, it took like 45 minutes. In the car, because of the traffic and the snow and everything, it took three hours to get home. Absolutely wild. So on one hand, I love that everything shuts down. I love that everybody, all the Brits are like, you know what? Let's just, let's just cancel today. Because in Canada, that would absolutely never happen. On the flip side though, it can be really annoying because people will panic buy at the grocery store. So we get a little bit of snow, all the bread's gone, all the milk is gone, all the eggs are gone. I don't know why people need all these things for a couple of days of snow. It's really annoying, but I do like that everything shuts down. We're just like, you know what? 
We'll try again tomorrow. Next up, let's talk about the underground. So this person says, Londoners love to complain about the underground. They have no idea how good they have it. You can get anywhere you want in half an hour on goddamn public transportation. I live in a city that is roughly 100th the size of London and getting from one end to the other by bus takes almost an hour. And someone else commented, the tube is one of the most amazing methods of public transit ever. Once there was a slight delay by about two minutes, the train conductor apologized profusely over the loudspeaker about it. Meanwhile, on the DC Metro, if there's a delay of any kind, you'll never hear an apology. I do think that British people, I love you. I think you do take some things for granted because it's just how it is here. Like you don't realize that other places are different, right? And public transport is one of them. Of course, I don't live in London, so I can't utilize the tube, but every time I go into London, it's there, it's easy, it's accessible, it's fabulous. Same with public transport. It's not perfect, certainly not. And it's not always cheap, certainly not. When it comes to the trains, sometimes a bit expensive, but it is possible and it is there and you can get places on public transport that is not something that i could ever do back home and that is the only reason why i've been able to get through these last what three years without a car is because the public transport is so good so i know that it's not perfect it's very easy to complain about stuff it's very easy to say oh this is crap and here's why i totally get it but also i think it helps to have that perspective that other places have it so much worse. And what we have here in the UK is actually quite special. Your washing machine is in the kitchen. Yes. <laughs> in all of my homes in Canada, even student homes, I lived in this kind of crappy student house. All of those properties have had a basement and in the basement is the washing machine. It's the um, dryer. You usually have like a hanging rack to hang some stuff up, but there is some sort of like laundry room in the basement. So it gets its own room, like someplace else. And I think while typically homes in the UK are smaller than what you would see in North America, you don't have the privilege of having a room dedicated to your laundry. At least no one I've known here has, and I certainly haven't. So where else do you put your washing machine? It's gotta go in the kitchen. There's no other way around it. Greeting people with you all right? It always makes me wonder if I look sick or if there is something wrong with me. Later found out it's similar to how Americans greet each other with how are you slash how's it going? This is something that still um, throws me off sometimes. I'm always expecting to hear it, but when I hear it, I never know how to respond. <laughs> and it is absolutely similar to North Americans say, hey, how's it going? Or saying, hey, what's up? Or, you know, any sort of just non-committed greeting because you're not really asking how they are or if they're okay um, or anything personal about them. You're just, it's just sort of like a throwaway line. You all right versus how's it going or what's up. You're not looking for an in-depth response. You're actually hoping to not receive an in-depth response because that would be very awkward. But it is one of those phrases that I don't say you all right, um, unless someone has said that to me and I'm like responding. Um, I don't feel confident just, hiya, you all right? Although I did say that to the postie the other day. So that might actually be changing quite soon. It's weird how your language changes. The way people say bye on the telephone. I have heard very serious medical conversations between professionals end with, all right, bye, bye, bye. It starts at a high pitch and just sings its way, way, way up the vocal register. Both men and women do this. In seven years in the UK, I never heard a single local comment on the bizarre opera that ends these calls. All right, that's enough for me. Bye, bye, bye. I love this. I think it is so funny. I think it is so sweet and endearing. I know exactly what they're talking about. And it's never usually just one bye. Like if you hear British people on the phone, it's not often like, all right, talk to you later, bye. No. All right, yeah, best to be going, yeah, all right. You take care now, all right, bye, 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 bye. 
You gotta at least have three. It's very silly, it's very sweet, it's cute, it's funny, it's heartwarming, it's wholesome, I just love it. Unfortunately, it's not really something that you hear in North America, but I feel like we should adopt it because it's just so, it's so sweet. <laughs> Are Brits weird? Perhaps. Definitely check out this video. I made my own list of weird things British people do that they think are normal. But as always, thank you guys so much for watching and until next time, bye!